All right, uh, we're a little over there, and uh, uh, I think we should say Russia, but we also say the CIA and their friends, <laughs> particularly Seidel. <laughs> uh, and uh, right now, um, a uh, rare uh, pleasure uh, with me is uh, uh, a good friend since 2004. Uh, there were four of us in Ohio uh, who did a lawsuit called Moss v. Bush and uh, issued a statement saying, uh, Kerry may be conceding, we do not concede. And, and again, some of you may know this, I mean, not that Kerry didn't have good legal help. He went to the best Republican law firm in the state. Taft Stentinius. He went to the Taft family and their probate lawyer told him nothing happened. But then Pete Pekarski appeared, our chief litigator, uh, and we went through a huge ordeal together. Uh, my role was, was mainly uh, to insist, go ahead and sanction. Sanction us, you'll have to hear our evidence because uh, I'm a full-time professor and part-time attorney, but Pete actually uh, put his law license on the line, uh, and there's numerous books about it. Uh, and he also came in number three in the DNC. There was Perez, right? And there was my former student, Keith Ellison, from Wayne State. And there was number three, Pete Pekarski, who actually talked about the integrity of the voting system. Pete. <laughs> Thank you very much, Bob. Um, let me just start out by, thank you very much for the introduction. The act of voting, uh, just going to the local polling place and casting a ballot, is the only means, means by which the power to govern is legitimately conferred in this country. An attack on any part of the voting process is in effect an attack on America. These attacks do not require guns or planes or troops. Without security for the entire voting process, that is somebody paying attention to the entire voting process on a state by state, county by county, nationwide basis, in answer to a question which was just asked, our na on a permanent basis, that means in these county boards of election, on a regular basis, whether that's once a week or once a month, somebody there locally is there all the time, every county in this country. In response, there was a question asked, what do we do, what has to happen? There's probably only one group that can do that, but I'll get to that later. Anyway, without that effort, without security for the entire voting process, our essential national security is severely degraded. There is evidence of a successful attack last year by one or more persons, as yet unidentified, who tampered with the vote in the 2016, pre 2016 presidential primary and general elections and at least three U.S. Senate races. What's the evidence? Our State Department observes elections around the world using international election observers. After a foreign election, the State Department either certifies that the election was a free and fair election or refuses to make such a certification. An international election observer wrote an article stating that if the November 8, 2016 election had occurred anywhere outside the United States, the State Department would have refused to certify that the election was a free and fair election. The State Department would also have reported that, that, that there is a suspicion of fraud or error. That international election observer, by the way, was Robert Fetrakis. The State Department uses exit polls to determine whether it will make a certification for a given foreign election. Um, there's a link at my website, peter4dnc.com. Peter, the number four, dnc.com, uh, to a State Department document about vote count certification, explaining how they use exit polls, or referencing their use of exit polls. There are a lot of other documents there, some of, some of which we'll be discussing and looking at uh, later uh, this afternoon. The reason the State Department would refuse to certify the election was free and fair is the highly improbable shift in results from the unadjusted exit polls to the reported vote counts. Uh, to understand the State Department's view, one must understand a few things about, uh, just about polls. The results of a typical pre-election poll are candidate Jones 52% and candidate Smith 48% with a 3% margin of error at a 95% level of confidence. The 95% level of confidence means that 95% 90, of the time if the posters if the pollsters receive responses from 
everyone who voted, the vote for candidate Jones would have been between 55 and 49 percent, which is 52 plus or minus 3. And, and for candidate Smith, the vote would have been between 51 and 45, which is 48 plus or minus 3. Similar statements can be made about an exit poll. Let's have the first chart, please. Uh, it's up already. Uh, this is a chart, and I'll try and explain some of the... Uh, Okay, now we have the mic and the chart. Let's see. Okay, so taking a, all the charts are set up in a similar form, but just to go through one of them, we have an exit poll share of 46.5%, which is right here in the middle. That's the green line. There's a, yeah, I guess you can't see it on here. It's, it's light gray. There's a 95% confidence interval that runs from about here to about here from 44 and a half, 44 and a half to 48 and a half. That was the unadjusted exit poll share. When the vote was cer certified, um, Trump's reported vote share in North Carolina was 50.5%. This is way outside the margin of error. It's so far, to, so far outside the margin of error that it's expected to occur once every 18,000 elections or once every 72,000 years. In short, if these exit poll results were correct, when the voters cast their ballots, the voters in North Carolina did not cast 50.5% of their votes for Donald Trump. Let's go to the next slide. Um, Florida, same type of thing. We have an uh, exit poll share of 46.4, uh, and when the final vote got certified, it was way outside the margin of error. Expect that result once about, about once every 880 years. Going on to the next slide, which I think is Pennsylvania. Um, exit poll share, in this case for Hillary Clinton, was 50.5%. You can see the confidence interval a little bit better there, that um, the, the blue, blue area. She ended up, when they certified the vote, way off at 47.6%, lost the state. It's expected to occur once every 340 years. Uh, the next one is, I think, Wisconsin. Um, Wisconsin, uh, Trump had an exit poll, um, exit poll share of, I'm sorry, yeah, 44.3, ended up out here way on the edge, outside the margin of error, 47.8%. Just with the 29 votes from Florida and the 15 votes from North Carolina, uh, Hillary Clinton would have won the election with 271 electoral votes. To get, which is something to think about. Um, in short, it, it is possible that those exit poll results were wrong, but it, it looks unlikely. It is possible that Trump won, actually won, but highly improbable. The same type of shift outside the 95% margin of error occurred, occurred in the Senate elections in Missouri. We have Kander here who had 52.3% in the exit poll. When they certified the vote, he was on at 46.2%, way outside the margin of error. Uh, that is expected to occur by chance about once every 11,000 Senate elections or once every 660 years. Next one, I think, is Russ Feingold in Wisconsin, 50.7%. That's a, that's a win. When the exit poll uh, data came out, the unadjusted exit poll, as the polls closed, reported by the American networks and, and the Associated Press. Um, when the final came out, it was at 46.8%, way outside the margin of error. That's expected to occur by chance about once hundred, every 110 years. In short, it, uh, this does not look like it is entirely probable that's not what happened when the voters cast their ballots. The last one is Pennsylvania. Uh, we have an exit poll share of 50% uh, for McGinty. Uh, there's the confidence interval. The result was outside the confidence interval at 47.2. That's also highly improbable. It occurs expected to occur by chance. And because these are polls, there's samples involved, you could get a, a, a result by chance. In this case, it's once every 60 times. This also probably didn't happen. But it did do something else. What it did was... Um, elect a Republican Senate. 
Because with those three votes, Missouri, Wisconsin, and Pennsylvania, the current balance in the U.S. Senate would be 51 people in the Democratic caucus and 49 in the Republican caucus. Instead, uh, it's 52 to 48 Republican. And Neil Gorsuch has a lifetime seat on the U.S. Supreme Court. According to research uh, performed by uh, Theodore de Machado Soares of the website tdmsresearch.com, the same type of vote shifting outside the margin of error occurred in the spring primaries, where out of 27 uh, Democratic primaries with exit poll results, the, the exit poll results shifted outside the margin of error against Bernie Sanders 12 times. And there were no shift against, uh, shifts against Hillary Clinton. It is theoretically possible, but highly improbable, that such results occurred by chance. Uh, by way of comparison, in the 23 Republican primaries, where exit poll results were analyzed by Mr. Suarez, there were two shifts outside the margin of error against Donald Trump and no shifts outside the margin of error against any other Republican candidate. There are only two possibilities, just two, with respect to the certified vote counts in 2016. Either the wildly improbable vote counts occurred by chance or they did not. If the vote counts did not occur by chance, they occurred because some person or persons arranged for them to occur. The exit poll to vote count shifts uh, in the presidential race on the charts we've just seen say nothing about how such, such a shift was caused, nor do they identify precisely who might have caused such a, thif, a shift. There are a few things that we know, however. In, uh, we still got it? Got it? Okay, in um, affidavits filed after the election in connection with the uh, Jill Stein recount, computer science experts stated that vote totals could be changed by tampering with software. With respect to the Democratic primaries, if those shifts were deliberate, the shift was caused either by someone who wanted Hillary Clinton to win the nomination, or alternatively, someone who wanted Bernie Sanders to lose and be unable to challenge Donald Trump with Bernie's populist message going up against Donald Trump's populist message uh, in November. If the vote shifts um, in the presidential election were deliberate, in the general, they were caused by someone who wanted Donald Trump to win. And if the vote shifts in the Senate races were deliberate and coordinated, they were caused by someone who wanted the Republicans to control the Senate and the entire Congress. The charts do not establish that Donald Trump or Hillary Clinton or any Republican or anyone acting at their direction had anything to do with what it appears probable was deliberate tamper tampering with the results of the presidential election, the three Senate races and some of the Democratic primaries. It, seems, it thus seems probable that some unknown person or persons demonstrated the ability to tamper successfully with the results of both the primaries and the general election in 2016. This person or persons are free to tamper with every future election starting right now. In short, recent statements by various journalists that there is no evidence of vote tampering in 2016 are incorrect. You've seen the evidence, and there are arguments which we can make about the evidence and about its accuracy. But whether there will be proof of vote tampering by identified persons remains to be seen. As Bob mentioned, a similar capability to tamper with the result of a presidential election was demonstrated in 2004. Um, by the way, I did want to thank uh, Professor Ron Bayman of Benedictine University in Illinois and Professor Greg Kilcup of The Ohio State University for their, their help with the 2016 charts, which we've looked at. If we can go to the 2004 charts, just for a second. Um, Ron Bayman, Bob Fatrakis, and I investigated the uh, vote tampering in 2004. Uh, charts were set up slightly differently, but in any event, this is Kerry, the Kerry vote in Ohio. If Kerry had won Ohio, uh, and that was the contest where, where I was the lead trial counsel in the, in the Ohio Supreme Court, he would have won the presidency. Matter of fact, I got, we got a motion in, which if granted would have put him in the White House. Anyway, here's the, the curve again. Um, the exit poll result here was right here at 52.1%. We used a 90% confidence interval. Uh, and the reported result, 48.7%, is outside that margin of error. In short, that, 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 it does not look like that result um, 
was what the people intended when they cast their ballots in, o in Ohio. Let's go to the next couple, just uh, as you can see what the other, other things like that happen. I think the next one in uh, 2004, uh, here's the national poll, um, it's even worse. Uh, Kerry won with, uh, in the exit poll, he had 50.8%. 50, 50 uh, the reported result on a national basis was 48.1, which is way outside uh, both the 90% 90, 90 confidence band and the 95% confidence band. There were two other charts, I think, from 2004, just so you'll, uh, New Hampshire, which Kerry happened to win, there was also a major shift from 54.9% down to 49.3%. Uh, and there was one, and I think even at 49.3, Kerry won in New Hampshire, and there was one in Pennsylvania, the same kind of thing going on. 54.1% in the exit poll shifted all the way down to 51.1 um, when the res results were certified. Ron, and Bob, Ron Bayman and Bob and I spent a, a number of years, we, we and, and others devoted uh, numerous man years um, to investigate, I didn't realize I was speaking that slowly. Anyway, devoted numerous man years um, to investigating the results. We finally published an article in 2006 uh, in which we got an admission from a Republican director of a county board of elections who admitted that the vote counting, the electronic vote counting system uh, in Ohio included votes never, never lawfully cast in the certified total for president in his county in Ohio in 2004. Uh, there has been speculation that Russia may have tampered with the 2016 vote. The intelligence agencies uh, have been quite clear that they have no evidence of any tampering with the vote count by the Russians, uh, if you, which also means uh, that they may have been evidence, there may have been vote tampering, there may have been evidence of vote tampering, just none by the Russians, which, which they're willing to talk about. It is time to consider whether a person or persons in the United States who has both an interest in controlling the outcome of the elections, perhaps for political or financial reasons, and the financing to accomplish the, the tampering, and remain unidentified. That is, whether there is such a person as opposed to some type of foreign actor. Uh, even without uh, determining who's responsible for what appears to be from these exit poll results, a deliberate and generally unrecognized attack on our national security through tampering with the vote. There are means to prevent or substantially reduce the possibility of such vote tampering and software tampering in 2018 and 2020 and later years. Uh, the roles of registered voters are typically maintained on a statewide computerized database, which you've heard about today. There are electronic poll books, which are problematic at some voting locations. In many areas, there are computers used in either casting or counting uh, the votes or both. In 2017, two secretaries of state, Deborah Bowen of California and Jennifer Bruner of Ohio, commissioned studies which established then, 10 years ago, that there were major flaws in the voting system. Specifically, respected computer experts reported to each secretary of state that the machines used to record and count votes could be tampered with easily, either in person or via remote electronic access. So let's consider two things. One, what can be done to reduce or eliminate the cybersecurity risk? And two, what can be done the day after our presidential election if the unadjusted exit polls or other evidence uh, again indicate vote tampering? As far as reducing or eliminating the cybersecurity risk, there are measures which will increase transparency, bolster the confidence of all voters that their vote was accurately counted, make a cyber attack on the vote casting or counting system next to impossible, and I'm also going to mention a few other related issues. First and most importantly, use hand-marked paper ballots which are hand-counted at each polling site as soon as the polls close. The results are posted at... Thank you. The, the results are posted at each polling site. Every voter understands the technology of the paper ballot and the security of a ballot box. Secondly, eliminate electronic poll books and use paper poll books at the polls. There are, <laughs> there are well known steps which can be taken to ensure the accuracy of these paper poll books. Uh, if you want, we'll discuss it in the question period. Um, third, planned regular audits before the vote is certified are an excellent idea, especially using the Minnesota model, which increases the scope of the audit each time sufficient, sufficient errors are discovered. Um, 
Third, the uh, election system was designated as critical infrastructure by the Ob Obama administration. This is a bad idea to the extent it leads to a security classification being placed on election information currently available to the public. Uh, support the secretaries of state who have actively opposed federal efforts to interfere with constitutionally protected state election administration. Without open access to the details of what's going on in the election system, the nationwide effort I was talking about is going to be well nigh impossible. There are two other issues I wanted to mention. Um, one is ballot images. The official record of voter tent intent is typically the ballot, not a ballot image. There are some optical scan voting machines today which use software to create a ballot image and then count the ballot image, not the ballot. The results from these machines are less determined by pr proprietary software and possibly not by voter intent. Lastly, and this is a little bit technical, there's an issue of software attestation. That is, once a piece of software is certified by a certifying agency, how can you be sure that the software in use on a given machine a few thousand miles away is the same as the certified software? I'm, I'm advised by computer science experts and people who are tenured professors with degrees, PhDs in electrical engineering and computer science, or both, that the answer is, with current technology, one cannot attest to the fidelity of the software. The software should not be used to cast or count votes. Finally, a proposal as to what we do with a future presidential election when the unadjusted exit polls or other evidence indicate vote tampering. Uh, courts will allow a case to proceed only if the plaintiff has standing, a particular injury or situation not shared by everyone. In the case of a presidential election, the people with standing are the candidates for president and vice president. My proposal resolves the standing issue. I proposed uh, to the Democratic National Committee that the Democratic Party place a condition on those who seek the party's nominations for president and vice president. The condition is that in order to be recognized as a candidate for the Democratic nomination, each candidate will have to agree in writing in advance that if the chair of the Democratic National Committee notifies the candidate after the polls have closed that there are reasonable grounds to believe a challenge to an apparent loss would be meritorious, the candidate will provide all necessary cooperation, for example, agreeing to serve as a named plaintiff, to the DNC's efforts to challenge the result. In short, the candidates withstanding will cooperate with an immediate court case to protect the votes and the election. Uh, this proposal has been endorsed by Seth Waxman, Solicitor General of the United States from 1997 to 2001. The Solicitor General is the official who represents the United States in the U.S. Supreme Court. A copy of the proposal is at the endorsements tab of the PeterFordDNC.com website. I leave you with three points. The unadjusted exit polls are evidence, evidence of tampering with the vote for the 2016 Democratic presidential nominee, president, and the U.S. Senate. The way to reduce or eliminate cybersecurity risk is to use hand-counted paper ballots counted on election night at each polling site. And third, the Democratic Party should require the nominees for the Democratic presidential and vice presidential nominations to agree when they start to campaign for the nomination to cooperate immediately with any election contest deemed meritorious by the party chair. In conclusion, as former Attorney General Robert Kennedy said, Others have seen what is and asked why. I have seen what could be and asked why not. Thank you very much. Go ahead. Oh, wow. Yeah, go, ahead. Yeah, go ahead. Just a, a quick question. Hi, my name's Mather. A quick question about if you could speak at all to the calling off of the, um, of the you know, during the California primary they, and other states, they stopped doing um, any kind of polling afterwards. That's uh, my understanding. I'm sorry, are you talking about it? Yeah. yeah they're, the they're, stopping they're, of exit polling, like what would, what would help, why at a certain point won't they just be like, we're not going to do exit polls in anything? It's a private venture. The, 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 you know, it, it's organized by journalistic organizations, and they're free to either do it or not do it. Um, it sure, it, it's very useful, as you've seen. And b because of the utility of these exit poll results, the people conducting them, um, 
have, you know, have, have some serious, I get apparently reservations about continuing some of the exit polls. And you're quite right, the number of exit polls has decreased over time. Yes? Uh, I liked what you presented. It is so clear. It is, uh, we'll, we'll stop a lot of Republican and Democratic flip-flopping. This information, I think, needs to be, our efforts need to be publicizing it. I just got a email 10 minutes ago that the Disclosure Act was signed by Governor Brown this afternoon. <laughs> that happened because we have been on the streets, petition signing, getting organizations, working our buns off at the grassroots level. We didn't start at the top. And I wonder if that kind of public education wouldn't further this cause. It sure will. I quite agree with you. And thank I you very much for all of your efforts. I think that's where we need to start. I, I should also mention, I, I see that John, Dr. John Simon is about to step up to the microphone and ask a question. John is the person who gets credit for first downloading the exit poll data, the unadjusted exit poll data in 2004 and making it available. And he's continued. <laughs> Um, he's continued to do that work uh, from then until now. We all uh, thank him and owe him a great debt of, debt of gratitude. John, he also did some great work on the 06 and 08 elections, pointing out there were a lot of, it looked like the same kind of vote shifting happened. That is from the unadjusted exit polls to the final certified totals happened in the 2006 and 2008 election, costing whether it was 20, 30, John's got the numbers. Uh, Democrat seat in the U.S. seats in the U.S. House of Representatives on each occasion. Dr. Simon. Thanks, thanks, Peter. I'll, I'll hold my comments on all that till when I actually present because it is integral to my thing. But thank you very much, and thank you also for uh, running for 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 DNC chair. That's another form of 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 bringing this out into the public discourse, um, which is a pretty uh, high barrier of entry actually to run for an office and a lot to take on. Uh, but it's something that that we we need to consider. I had 14 questions. I'll I'll, I'll ask one. Um, <laughs> And that is, you know, I like your proposal with, with, the, with you know, Kerry took $15 million, a, a, a thousand of which was mine, uh, to contest the election in the event that it was stolen. And then I don't know what, what boat or, or second home he bought with it, but we never saw that money and it was never put into action. That was a crime, in my opinion. That was false advertising. It was fraud on his part. However, in your proposal, you're handing that over to the chair of the DNC where is there real security in that, given that the Democrats as a whole have been absolutely, you know, AWOL, absolutely AWOL when it comes to this stuff? Yeah. I guess there's a little bit of self-interest here, and I, 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 I did expect somebody else was going to do it. I think we can probably, count, I hope we can count on Tom Perez. But you will, will recall that I, I, I was proposing to put somebody in place who I could count on to make the right call as chair of the Democratic National Committee. Uh, I mean, quite, quite, people have asked, how can this get done? And quite, I, quite, quite I, just giving it to you with the bark off, as far as I can tell, the only group in this country with the motivation possibly the resources, the people, and the organization to do what's, what is needed in terms of reforming this election system and protecting our national security, protecting the, the, the system, is a properly energized and properly directed Democratic National Committee. Go ahead. <laughs> and I realize there may be people who have a different view of the matter, but from, you know, I've been on the ground doing this, I mean, um, for years. Um, going, going, to, going, you know, to boards of election ahead of the election, to well ahead of the election, to watch what's going on, to make sure things are going to be set up to operate properly on election day, and being there on election day in the middle of big cities, going into 50 or 60 polling places to make sure that people get the right to vote, that they're not denied the right to vote, that things move smoothly, that they're not stopped, and there have been efforts uh, by Republicans and others to stop people from voting. We've stopped that, but. Given this background and this experience uh, and education, if you will, about what's going on, that's my view of the matter. Next question. Going backwards, why is it that the Democratic leadership has rolled over so easily? You'd have to ask them. Do you have it, do you, can you speculate? 
I, I would. You don't uh, want to speculate. I, I would rather not speculate. Okay. I mean, I'm, I'm sorry that, that 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 doesn't give you much, but I I think you're really. One of those leaders is on a national book tour, I think. Um, so if if you happen to be at the book tour, um, it's a free country. Feel free to ask. Yeah. And please let us know what 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 response you get. Yes, ma'am. Oh, hi. My name is Olga Osborne from San Francisco, and. During the 2016 election, um, I heard from journalists all the time that the, that the exit polls were really off in favor of Hillary Clinton. And so recently I went to a town hall meeting where Nancy Pelosi was speaking and I got to talk to her after, after her talk. And I said something to her about the exit polls being off and she said, oh no, no, there was no problem with the exit polls at all. So how do you deal with this when people in power, well, I guess you just said, you know, like Hillary Clinton, are denying that there was any problem with the exit polls? The, there's, when people talk about exit, educating people about exit polls, it takes a while. I'm going to try and in, 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 encapsulate several years worth of information in about 20 seconds here. There are two, there's an unadjusted exit poll which is made available when the polls close. Those results are then changed by the people who conduct the exit poll. Later on, when the official results come in, they reweight the sample, the samples I've shown you. Those samples get reweighted on the assumption that the vote count is accurate and their original sample wasn't. So they reweight the sample to show that the exit poll matches the certified result. That's a very short answer. It's pretty complicated, but Nancy Pelosi thought the exit polls were okay. There are a number of other people who, and a lot of evidence that indicates the exit polls were, were correct. That is the unadjusted data from the exit polls. Yeah. yeah yes. Okay. Uh, this is the last question. Okay. Okay. This just kind of ties into hers. So, um, from what I've understood from people I consider much smarter than me in this area, that unadjusted exit polls are highly accurate. So I've uh, recently run into somebody who said that's been negated by the New York Times, by the nation, that, you know, so, so me not knowing where to send them, because <laughs> she wanted something legitimate and not fake news. So I, I want to be part of this educating, so I'm just asking you where to send them. Great question. Okay. The answer is that the New York Times, the Washington Post, the networks, uh, which you all watch, the people who sponsor this poll, when they publish the results, even on the unadjusted exit polls, say uh, they quote a margin of error that is down in the fine print. If you look at, if you look at those, those long stories they write, they got the results, you know, wait, look way down in the fine print, they quote a margin of error, which they can only do if there were a proper random sample. And that proper random sample is the unadjusted exit poll we're talking about. And by quoting that margin of error, they're saying that that initial sample was a proper random sample because you cannot take a, a non-random, this is a very technical st statistics issue. The, the bottom line is, and Bob can maybe address it in a, in a second briefly, Bob's got the necessary education and training and experience and expertise on this issue. You can't take a non-random sample, reweight it, and then go and treat it as a random sample. But the New York Times, the Washington Post, all the journalistic organizations treat, treat those exit polls, starting with this unadjusted exit poll, as a random sample. I mean, there are, there are adjustments made. I should mention we do make an adjustment for the fact they're, they're sampling people in clusters. But the point is, I do not believe in fake news. The Washington Post, the New York Times, most of the rest of the cable outlets, at least MSNBC, CNN, ABC, CBS, I think I've got most of them. Anyway, do not believe in fake news. And if, if you think that the Times and the Post and the rest of them are, are, are doing this wrong, you're saying it is, amounts to agreeing, yes, they're disseminating fake news. That does not appear to be, to me, to be what they're doing. And I hope that answers your question about the exit polls. Yeah, that is, uh, yeah, right, and that's contravened by their own conduct. So they're saying one thing in this article, but when you look at, look at their reporting, it, it says something else. Pete Pekarski.
There's a quick answer to your question. The elephant in the room, money, M-O-N-E-Y, big money. Sure, uh, Bob, thank you for bringing up the issue of money. Um, I just want to mention the m money is needed. Um, um, if you'd like to help out, I appreciate your applause. If you'd like to help out, the Columbus Institute of Contemporary Journalism uh, sponsors some of this research. A lot is needed to, to do the research that is needed to come with, with articles like the one the one we came up in 2006, finally establishing what happened in Ohio in one of those counties. It's 1021? 1021 East Broad Street in Columbus, Ohio, 432.05. 432.05. It's the Columbus Institute for Contemporary Journalism, 1021 East Broad Street, Columbus, Ohio, 432.05. Um, please mention it's for the Pekarsky Project. Thank you very much, and thank you for all you're doing, and my thanks to all those watching the live stream for all you're doing to help protect uh, the security of our country and the election system.